To it says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why we worship, that's why we gather to exalt the name that is above every name. So would you pray with me? Lord, we just come before you. We exalt you in this place. God, whether we're sitting on a couch in our living room, whether we're driving, whether we are, God, whatever we may be doing, just allow for praise to flood our hearts and exalt you over every situation and every place. our 
Hey Calvary, welcome to our See Wow Church Without Walls gathering resource video stuff. We are here today with a special guest, um, Stefan Wisniewski, and you may know Stefan as, um, well you may know him if you've been around Calvary a long time, you may know him as a part of the Calvary family dating all the way back to Penn State University. 2007. 2007. Yeah. So that, I got to think about that. So that's 13, 15 years ago. Yeah. Wow, that's great. So Stefan was a part of our Calvary family going all the way back to 2007. And Stefan, uh, more recently, is a, a two-time Super Bowl champ. And, and, uh, and then more recently after that, he's graduated from professional football, and now he's a pastor in training. So I'm just, we're just going to do a little bit of an interview kind of deal, and then Stefan is going to bring us the word in the next... Um, series on conversations with with Jesus. So, so Stefan, let me let me just let me just start out with kind of that idea of conversations with Jesus. And if if you were going to have, you, you don't have to tell us what you're going to be speaking on, but if you were going to have a conversation with Jesus, if it was Jesus sitting here, not me, um, what, what what's a couple of the questions you would ask him? What are some of the burning kind of man? If I could have a face to face with Jesus, here, here's here's where the conversation would go. If if he let me choose. Oh man, that's a good one. Um, my first thought is like, what do you have planned for my life? Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, like there's a reason he doesn't tell, tell us exactly us. what's sure. planned for our sure. life. So while my human nature says that would be the most important thing yeah. I should know, like I also probably shouldn't know that. <laughs> uh, probably in my best interest, let alone if there was good things or bad things sure. ahead. Yeah. 
I'd probably rather not know. Man, I, I mean, my first thought is, and I think we'll get to ask this in eternity, and I don't think we'll get to understand it until eternity, but man, I've been wrestling with the like, how does God's sovereignty and man's free will like come together, collide? Yeah. Um, spent a lot of brokenness I've seen in the world yeah. and some family and friends recently. Yeah, and, and in seminary, we're digging into, you know, God's sovereignty, who he is, that he's all powerful, almighty, he's in control. And just kind of how those two work together. Yeah. Um, and a lot of smart people have thought about that for yeah. a long time. And yeah. it's, it's hard to wrap our heads around. But I'm looking forward to kind of having an understanding yeah. of that probably the other side of eternity. Yeah, you bet, you bet, man. There's something about going through those hard times that causes us to really dig in, to understand, God, who are you? What's your place in my life? How do we partner together in this in this journey? Um, that's good. Some some people, like I, I said initially, may not, uh, may not have realized this, but you've been part of the Calvary family for quite a while, going back to 2007. I, I wasn't knowing how far back that was, but um, going back to your days as a as a Penn State student, um, I, just share a memory. It might even be the least favorite memory of your time at Calvary as a Penn State student, or most favorite, or just a memory. Um, what what were those days like for you? Man, I remember. So we started 2007. We're at on University Drive right, in yeah. that building, and like we were really outgrowing that building. So then we moved to the State High like auditorium. Yeah. Uh, and I remember I was too big. So, for, so first, oh yeah, yeah. So that was the State High Auditorium on the left-hand side. The of older the, State the old, High, yeah, 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 yeah old State yeah. High, not the fancy right. new building. Yeah. yeah. So I don't even know if that's the high school yeah. anymore. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, part of it. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So I remember I was too big for the seats, right. like the auditorium <laughs> seats. Like I would have like been like this. So me and the other football guys and athletes, we sat in the front row because then yeah. we had some leg room. So yeah, so we had our little like tall person athlete section right. up front. I and uh, I just remember worshiping hard, loving it, enjoying learning from you and had a good community of Christian students yeah. kind of there that we would fellowship with, you know, before and after church. And uh, I really grew a lot, you know, as a result of your teaching, yeah. kind of some friendships and fellowships yeah. I had there within Calvary. Uh, and some other campus ministry yeah. groups as well, but it was a it was kind of a a cool group of of players of friends who were coming. When you talk about that that large group down in the front row, large um, meaning yeah, overweight large, and heavy well, and muscular, big, right? Why, <laughs> you know, like even even when you had leg room, it was hard to fit in the in the seat itself. I remember that. And uh, who, who were some of the other who were some of the other guys? I remember Gerald. He, he was he was Gerald pretty Cadogan, faithful. Gerald yeah. Who were some of the other guys who were coming at that time? Yeah, Gerald was kind of older than me, so he kind of okay. kind of helped bring me. He might even be the reason I went to Calvary. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then there was a, a different kind of group of guys as people moved through. I remember inviting different friends yeah. all the time, um, off and on, and kind of changed who was yeah. there week to week. But yeah. it was it was cool to kind of bring different teammates along yeah. and help them grow. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So uh, w one of my questions kind of post football, because because this kind of yeah, I, I, I played football and and uh, <laughs> and if somebody said to me that I was I weighed more than an offensive lineman, like that would be an insult from the coach. So so what, what do you weigh now post post professional football? I, I lost 60 pounds. Wow, so, 60 pounds. Yeah, 60 pounds. I used like to be. lost a person. Yeah, I Small mean, person, like a but... middle school person, <laughs> at least. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I just dropped a big heavy weight off my back, and I'm like, wow, I, I can walk around a lot easier yeah. and move around a lot easier. Actually, my wife used to make fun of me, so the way I would get up out of a chair yeah. when I was 315, like, I had to, like, throw my weight into it. Like, you can't just stand up when you're, th you're like, huh, and you like, grunt. You know? And like now I'm just like, I'm just up. Like, hey, what's going on? What are you guys doing? What, what, what are you doing over there? I'm just, I'm up. And it's yeah. like, I, I took great. a monkey off my back. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it feels great. Lost about 60, um, about 260 now, and it, it feels great. Yeah. Uh, I haven't it, seen 260 for a long time. It, it was a lot of work to lose it. It was not fun. There was a lot of days of eating zero carbs and zero fat, and those are just the best things, right? <laughs> carbs and fat, but... uh. I definitely ate more of them than I needed to there. Yeah. So cut back, but it, it worked and it feels great. That's good. That's good. So now that you've graduated from professional football to pastor and training, what, what's been your, you're just kind of in the beginning of your seminary education, kind of going for the full, full deal. Um, what, what's been your favorite class so far? What, and what'd you gain from that? I really enjoyed uh, Old Testament 
Um, mm. I'll be taking two of them, but I took Old Testament one, and I tell you, like it, it really gave me a renewed appreciation and yeah. love for studying the Old Testament. And if I'm honest, like my normal kind of relationship with the Old Testament is like I love the Psalms, sure. love stories of David, yeah, stories yeah, of yeah. Moses. Yeah. But to be honest, like if you said, "Hey, dig into Leviticus or right. Isaiah," I'd have been like, "I mean, I will," but yeah. like I probably wouldn't have been super excited about it. Yeah. Um, and I think my attitude was just like, "Man, it's so much work." To understand the Old yeah. Testament. It's just kind of just kind of easier to pick up a New Testament passage, get something out of it, right? But I think what I learned is that you really just need a little bit of background info, and yeah. you can really understand sure. a lot about what's going on in the Old Testament. Like, if you want to understand Isaiah or really any Old Testament prophet, you just need to understand, you know, where am I in the timeline of Israel's history? Like, who's Isaiah writing to? Are we in exile? Are we out post-exile? Just where are we at? Who's he writing to? And then just having like a simple breakdown of like Isaiah chapter one to five, like is talking about this. Isaiah seven to 14 is talking about this. Because Isaiah goes from talking about the present to like the near future to like the distant future. And then he references the past, but he does it all kind of free flowing. And if you didn't know what he was talking about, it's easy to get lost. So just even having a, a study Bible or some resource that gives you, hey, this is talking about this, and you're like, okay, now I see what's going on. This is talking about this. Just having a little historical background really yeah. goes a long way, and, and then I think we can get a lot out of it. So if somebody came to you and said, hey, I, I want to understand the Old Testament better. I want to I want to be more kind of in tune with what was going on in the Old Testament. What what book would you tell them to start with? Uh, what book in the Old Testament? Yeah, yeah. Where, where would you have them start? Oh, great question. Um, not Leviticus, not Numbers. Yeah, I mean, I guess Genesis, right? Um, because it's the beginning and it it's a narrative, but you also get you get probably the the biggest covenants in the yeah. Old Testament there, and that's something else that just understanding the big covenants and how they kind of progressively revealed God to us. Um, so obviously, you know, it starts with with Noah and then uh, Abraham and yeah. then Moses. So you kind of you get those in Genesis. Moses comes in Exodus, but. Um, having an understanding of those covenants and how God relates to his people and and how that progresses yeah. throughout history is... There's really something valuable about seeing the full scope of the story of God. I mean, that's really the, the, the piece of it for me that, that makes an impact is, is the story... I mean, the New Testament, Jesus kind of comes into what's already happening and it's been going on for a long time. And, and to get that whole scope of salvation history, I just think that that's... That's really priceless. Yeah, That's... understanding the big picture, then at any point you zoom in yeah. on the little picture, yeah. it, it gives you the context yeah. and the purpose. And uh, one thing that really struck me was our professor told us that roughly one out of every eight verses in the New Testament is either a quote yeah. or a reference or an right. allusion to the Old Testament. And so if you want to understand the New Testament, you can't you not understand the Old Testament. It's just so heavily influenced by it. And man, the more I dig into the Old Testament, the more I'm understanding the yeah. new, and it's it's awesome. Yeah, those were the scriptures of Jesus. So, so uh, again, kind of back to that phrase. Now that you've graduated from professional football player to pastor in training, um, Eagles or Steelers? Ha! You trying to get me in trouble? <laughs> so I'm from so Pittsburgh. I'm from feet. Pittsburgh. In case you don't know that, <laughs> from Pittsburgh, played for the Steelers briefly, but I went to Philly, won a Super Bowl there. So. You're kind of asking me to tick I'm off not, like half the audience, Dan. Or, or, or figure out a way to answer that doesn't tick off. Well, that's what I usually do in the media, but this is like church. Right, I'm sure, trying to sure. be more honest, you know? So if I'm going to be real honest, like I'll, I'll root for the Eagles next year yeah. a lot, and I'll probably root for the Steelers like a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah, that's that's my real honest answer. R- root for the Steelers as long as they're not playing the Eagles or doing something that's going to impact the Eagles. Yeah, yeah. that's that's probably about right. Yeah. So you had family who played for Steelers, right? Uh, close friends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, close yeah. friends. Um, uh, Tunt Jokin was kind of a mentor yeah. to me, taught me a lot about football and Jesus. And John Kolb and uh, a bunch of my dad's buddies yeah. were Steelers. My dad yeah, yeah. played for the Colts. Yeah. Um, but I, had, I knew a lot of Steeler guys that yeah. kind of taught me the game. And so growing up in Pittsburgh, obviously, you kind of root for the Steelers. But it's weird, like... Even if you root for the Steelers your whole life, I got drafted by the Raiders, and all of a sudden, you know the Raiders sure. are the Raiders are giving me a paycheck every right, week, right. and it's like 
Steelers, like, what are you? What have you done for me lately? Like, Raiders are giving me a paycheck. Like, go Raiders, right? Right. So your allegiance, it, it can change uh, Whatever quickly. Whatever team you're on. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Favorite moment playing football or hardest moment? Either on both. Favorite and hardest moments oh, man, yeah. playing football. Um, All the way back. Could be Penn State, high school, on up, but probably looking more at pros. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of hard moments and a lot of yeah. awesome ones. Uh, hard to pick, but I'll just I'll just pick one of my. We'll start with one of the hardest. Um, probably getting uh, released by the Eagles. Um, yeah. It was only like a year after right. we won the Super Bowl with them. I won the Super Bowl with them, and yeah, I, I mean, I started, played well, everything's great, and sure enough, in the NFL, things change quickly, yeah. right? So they they fired me. And uh, they actually fired me, rehired me, and fired me again. I remember that. Oh, uh, you know, good times. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, pretty wild, the NFL. But, yeah, I mean, I, I got fired at the end of training camp 2019, which is a year and a half after I won the Super Bowl with them and was unemployed for about five weeks, kind of waiting, hoping someone else would sign me. And uh, it was a rough time. Yeah. You know, I really – you kind of wonder, like, am I ever going to play football again? Right. Like, why does nobody want to sign me? Am I not good? Um, but, man, it – I really trusted God. I really believed he was sovereign in it and had a plan for it and that he was still good. And because of that, I, I think I persevered well, had a yeah. good attitude through it. Um, and sure enough, you know, I end up signing with the Chiefs and winning the Super Bowl that yeah. year and starting for the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. So uh, I kind of went from one of the hardest moments in my career and, you know, months later it's one of the best. turned into one of the best. Yeah. And either of the Super Bowls, you know, could easily be one of sure. my best. But uh, the Chiefs one was cool just because of the journey that happened yeah. in between them, kind of with the valley in between uh, the two peaks there. And um, really fun to be a part of the Chiefs. Yeah. I mean, if you ever watch the Chiefs, like their offense is unbelievable. Yeah. Mahomes is fantastic. Formerly Tyreek Hill, he left. But Travis Kelsey, all this talent just up and down the field. Yeah. Amazing offense. Really fun as an O-lineman to be a part of yeah. that. Um, so going back to that question that you would ask Jesus that, you maybe shouldn't ask. I mean, that, that was that was a that was a little bit of a microcosm, a chapter in your life where you experienced both. You experienced kind of that, God, what are you doing? And the, oh yeah, th this was this was pretty good. I went through a hard time, led led to a good time. Just had to trust Him in the midst of it. So, yeah, yeah, that's an example of you know, if God told me that was all going to happen, yeah. it would have taken the fun out of it. Yeah, would have taken the the journey of faith out of it. Would have taken the growth, yeah. spiritual you growth. Know. Uh, the trust, right? Trust in him despite the doubt. Um, and it would have taken, you know, we walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. If we have sight, yeah. like it's not faith. It's not hard. It's not trust. And uh, that's why walking with Jesus is hard is it's by faith. But yeah. it, uh, man, it's, it's faith in something that's real. Yeah. You know, we're not just like hoping things will get better just because yeah. we want to be an optimist. Like, yeah. We believe God's in control and he's working this for our good yeah. because that's the truth. That's the truth. So so one of the things, you know, people have heard me say uh, before is um, a lot of my best life lessons, leadership lessons um, happened in, in team sports from middle school, you know, through to division three football, coaching football for a few years while I was in seminary. Um, a lot of my, a lot of those lessons really came from that. So, so an easy question to ask you would be, what are the life lessons, leadership lessons that, that you've learned um, through football, through team sports? But I, I'm just going to tweak it a bit. How, how has being a football player made you a better husband? Because it can't be the like, hit him as hard as you can. That that principle doesn't work, <laughs> right? You know, it's. Do everything you can to win. That doesn't that doesn't yeah. work all that well in in yeah. marriage. So how, how has what you've learned and gone through as a football player made you a better husband? You're not too far in that journey of being a husband, but yeah. five and a half but years always. married. Uh, my first thought is first of all, no one's ever asked me that. Yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to think for a second. But the interesting thing you say that is. In a lot of ways, like being a professional athlete makes you a worse husband. Yeah. It can, yeah, right? Sure. It doesn't have to. But so Talk professional athletes, first of all, like um, you have to be really focused on yeah. yourself to be a good athlete, right? Yeah. I got to be constantly thinking about what's my workout? What am I eating? What am I training? Did I drink enough water today? Did I get enough protein yeah. today? Did I watch enough film today? Like you, you got to be thinking about yourself all the time. And to be a good husband, you got to yeah. put your wife first, right? Yeah. So that that's like an attitude that has to kind of change, right? Yeah. And 
also as a pro athlete, like we're kind of used to people taking care of us, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah, right. anything we need, you, if I'm in the Philadelphia Eagles building, I'm an Eagle. Hey, I need a protein shake. Like someone will make me a protein shake. Hey, I need this. Someone will make me like, yeah. they just, they take care of you. Right. Yeah. And if you take that attitude home, yeah, that's not good. That's not good. Right. It's not good. Yeah. So Been there, uh, done that. exactly. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> the people who work for the Eagles work there to take right. care of me, but right. my wife does not exist that's to take right. care of me. Right. Um, so in some ways you're set up yeah. potentially for failure. Um, but to your question of how did it make me a better husband? I think for sure, like one of the really important things to be a good husband is having patience. Yeah. Um, my wife needs patience with me cause yeah. I'm a pain in the butt sometimes yeah. and we're all humans, right? I need patience to be a good husband and man, football you got to be patient because yeah. it's a long year. It's a long season. You put in work in January, February, March, April, and you don't see the fruit of that work till September, yeah. October, November, December. So um, I think football really helped me develop perseverance yeah. and patience. And I think to be a good husband, you're, you're going to need a lot of perseverance yeah. And, yeah. and patience. Yeah, that's good. You know, it. one of the things that, that hit me when I when I took Greek in uh in seminary was was the the close connection between even grammar wise word wise in the New Testament the close connection between patience perseverance and hope and and you when when you put those together you you're patient you say I'm not going to quit I'm going to do everything it takes to get to here and and then that develops that develops the hope which is huge for for marriage I mean to be able to have hope when you're going through a tough time you guys have gone through some some difficult times to to have hope that it's going to get better that we're going to make it through this um man that that's that's of such huge value so it's good um so uh stefan's going to be bringing us the word you're talking about in, in the in the whole focus of conversations with jesus you're you're kind of talking about the commitment that it takes to follow christ and uh so i'm i'm just going to pray for you and then we're going to launch into that looking forward to hearing what you have to say awesome Father, thank you so much for Stefan. Thank you for the journey that he is on, that, that he and his wife are on. And, and uh, God, thank you for the, the connection that, that we've had over the course of the years here at Calvary. God, thank you for everything that you have planned for his future. We don't know all that that is, and we know that it'll include um, hard seasons as well as great seasons, just like, just like it is for all of us. And, and God, we pray that um, as he... Um, talks to us about this conversation with Jesus, about um, being committed and following you, Jesus, with, with all our hearts. God, I, I pray that you would anoint him, that you would give him the words to say even in the moment. I, I pray that you would, even more importantly, anoint the ears of everybody listening, that we would hear whatever it is that you have to say for us um, through him. And, and uh, God, we thank you for opportunities that you give us to um, serve each other, to, to minister to each other, to be served even by others, and, and uh, just ask for your blessing in these next moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to it, Stefan. Thanks, Dan. Hey there, Calvary. I'm calling this sermon, What Jesus Says to Those Who Would Follow Him. So I'm in seminary and I'm learning lots of different things about the Bible, about Jesus, theology, morality. They're all good things. But I keep meditating on the question, what is the main thing? What is Jesus's core message? I don't want to lose the main thing in my studies of all kinds of secondary ideas. As I read through the Gospels, the phrase I keep hearing Jesus say over and over and over again is, follow me. Follow me. He says it many, many times, and he spends a lot of verses explaining what he expects of those who desire to follow him. I think when we see this phrase in the Gospels, our antennas should go up, like, this is important, Let's see what this passage can teach us about what Jesus is looking for from those who would call themselves his followers. We're going to look at two Jesus conversations from Matthew chapter 8, 
Both address the question, what does Jesus expect of his followers? One involves a scribe and one a disciple, though not one of the original 12 disciples. Think of these guys as two people interested in following Jesus, who Jesus has a lesson for. Think of them as people in our church, as us. Matthew 8, verses 18 to 19 read, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So this scribe, this new recruit, he seems really excited to follow Jesus. And to be honest, what I would expect Jesus' reaction to be to this statement is very different from what Jesus actually says. I would expect Jesus to say something like, that's fantastic, we would love to have you, welcome to our group of followers. But what Jesus does say is very different. Verse 20 goes on, And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So what Jesus says to this guy, who says he wants to follow him, is foxes have a home in holes, birds have a home in nests, but I, the Son of Man, do not have a home. I travel from place to place, preaching and doing God's will, but I lack the comfort of having a place to call home. So Jesus does not say to this guy, you don't want to follow me. But Jesus does want this man to clearly understand what he's getting into if he desires to follow Jesus. He wants this man to understand that following Jesus is not easy. Is it worth it? Absolutely. But is it easy? No. Let me clarify real quick by answering the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Also, this means, you know, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it be, mean to be a Jesus apprentice? I think for us today, to follow Jesus means to live how Jesus lived and to love how Jesus loved. That's important, so I want to say it again. To follow Jesus means to live how Jesus lived and to love how Jesus loved. And we get a very clear idea of what this looks like as we read throughout the four Gospels. This particular verse teaches us that to live like Jesus means to choose obedience to God's word and God's will over our own comfort whenever the two are in conflict. Do we have to give up all comforts? No. But when we have a choice between doing what we know God wants us to do and doing what would be more comfortable or easier for us, Jesus says we should choose obedience. This is what he expects of his followers. For example, we know that as Christ followers, we are called to spend time studying the Bible frequently. Let's say one morning you find yourself extra tired, right? We've all been there. And you have the choice between 20 more minutes of sleep or 20 minutes of reading your Bible. Man, 20 minutes of extra sleep sounds pretty comforting, doesn't it? But if that's the only time I'll have today to read my Bible, which will I choose? the comfort of more sleep, or the obedience of opening God's word. Or for another example, we know we're supposed to love our neighbors, right? Let's say you have a pretty busy weekend ahead of you, and your neighbor says they had something come up unexpectedly and they need to leave for the weekend. Can you take care of their dog for a few days? Now let's say it's January and you're not really a dog person, so walking their dog in the cold sounds terribly uncomfortable for you, let alone you're busy and it would be really inconvenient. Will you help them anyway? Or will you tell them sorry, but you're too busy to help them? Will you choose comfort or will you choose loving your neighbor because that's what Jesus called us to do? We have this choice often and Jesus says here that following him means choosing obedience over comfort. Now let's look at the next two verses in Matthew 8. Verses 21 to 22 read, Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. First, let me explain what's going on here. It might seem like this guy is saying that my dad's funeral is tomorrow. I want to go to that and then follow you. But it's more likely that bury my father means his father is still alive but elderly 
and the man is asking for an indefinite leave of absence from following Jesus to take care of his father and set his father's household in order. After all, the Bible does tell us to honor our father and mother. So this is a good thing, right? Yes, honoring our father and mother is a good thing. But Jesus' point here is that allegiance to him supersedes even allegiance to family if the two are ever in conflict. I don't think these two come in conflict very often in most of our lives. But if they do, it's clear what Jesus calls us to prioritize. But I do think this is also an example of a man having a choice between something good and something better. And Jesus calls him to choose the something better, which is obedience to him. A lot of our choices in life are not choosing between something good and something evil, but are like this man's choice, choosing between something good and something better. I like how Thomas Constable explains it. There are many worthy activities in life that a true disciple of Jesus must forego because he or she has a higher calling and higher demands on him or her. Foregoing these activities may bring criticism on the disciple from the spiritually insensitive, but that is part of the price of discipleship. End quote. I think the question this raises for all of us is, are there any, quote, good things in our life that we ought to leave behind in pursuit of the better thing of following closely after Jesus? That's important, so I want to ask it again. Are there any good things in our life that we ought to leave behind in pursuit of the better thing of following closely after Jesus? This is going to look different for each person, and I encourage you to spend some time this week prayerfully meditating on that question. But for me, this conflict has looked like this lately. I feel like God is calling me to write a book, and yet I've been too busy with other good things to get much work done on it. If spending time writing a book is what God is calling me to do, then I'm going to have to say no to doing some other good things in order to write that book. Just for full explanation on the passage, the phrase leave the dead to bury their own dead means leave the spiritually dead, i.e. those not interested in following Jesus, to bury the physically dead. One last thought on these verses. I believe Jesus' words to this man can teach us something else as well. And that's don't procrastinate fully committing to follow Jesus. This man essentially says, I will follow you, Jesus, after I do this one thing. A lot of people think, well, after college, then I'll really start following Jesus more closely. Or after I get that promotion and life calms, calms down a little bit, then I will. Or after my kids do such and such, then I'll have more time to obey. If following Jesus closely is the best thing we can do with our lives, let us not hesitate to fully commit to obedience. In calling us to choose him over our personal comfort, over other good things, and even over our families, Jesus sets a high bar for what it means to follow him. This bar can seem intimidatingly high like too high, like we could never reach it. So I want to close by giving a few reminders. One, he's God, so he gets to set the standard. Two, we are not responsible to reach that high bar using only our own strength. In fact, that's part of the reason the bar is set so high. It's unattainable for us in our own strength. God wants it to be that way. We can only live as Jesus lived, if we use the power of the Holy Spirit, which God freely pours out on his children when we ask for more of it. And we should ask to be filled with more Holy Spirit many times a day, every single day, for we are broken vessels who leak Holy Spirit constantly. Did you know that you leak Holy Spirit? It's true. That's why we're commanded in Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Although the tense of that verb doesn't quite capture the meaning of the Greek, because the Greek verb is in the continuous present tense, which we don't really have that tense in English, but if you translated it more literally, it would probably say, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, or be filled, then be filled again, then be filled again, then be filled again, then be filled again. I've seen this to be true in my own personal experience as well. 
You ever spend a bunch of time in the morning studying the word, praying, and you just feel really good, really full of the spirit, just like ready to conquer anything. And then you go on about your day, focus on earthly stuff for a few hours, kind of forget about Jesus for a little while. And then it's the afternoon and you find yourself like really just drained and empty again. I know I have. And you know why that is? Because we leak Holy Spirit. We need to ask God for more of it throughout our day. Why did God design us to need Holy Spirit so often? For the same reason he only gave the Israelites in the desert a one day supply of manna at a time. So we would remain dependent on God for our daily strength. Another reminder, in our pursuit of following Jesus, we will surely sin and fall so short of his standard of righteousness. We must remember that his grace covers our failures when we confess them to him. Finally, if we are really desiring to follow Jesus closely, we can't do it alone. We're going to need to be regularly connected to a small group of people who are also trying to follow Jesus. I'm not against large groups of Christians gathering, but in a large group, let's be honest, it can be easy to kind of hide. It can be easy to hear a message and walk away unchanged. But if the point of hearing scripture is to do it, as we have seen throughout the book of James, then the best context for this to happen is a small group of people who know what's going on in your life and can hold you accountable to living out your professed faith. To be in a group where people can ask you questions, questions like, how have you, have you been time spending reading? Sorry, have you been spending time reading the Bible? Have you been spending time in prayer recently? What has God been teaching you lately? Are you loving and serving your wife, husband, kids the way God calls you to? How have you loved your neighbors or coworkers lately? These questions aren't asked out of judgment, but out of a desire to see you flourish as a child of God. If you are already in a small group Bible study here at Calvary, awesome. Keep making it a priority to be there weekly. If not, I encourage you to commit to join one soon. I hear great things about the women's Bible studies from my wife, Hillary, and our men's Bible studies will be starting up again in early September after we, take a, after we took a break for the summer. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Uh, God, we thank you for your call to follow you. Uh, you are a good teacher. You desire to teach us good things. You desire to show us the path to life. But God, we have to be willing to submit and be learners, disciples who would seek to follow you and seek to live the way you lived and seek to love the way you loved. God, help us as your followers to understand what you ask of us. Help us to willingly lay down anything you would ask us to lay down in pursuit of serving you. Help us to lay down comfort if that's in the way of serving you. Help us to lay down other good things. Help us to even choose you, God, over a family if the two are in conflict. Fill us with your spirit. Guide us, strengthen us. Help us to strive toward that bar that you set of what it looks like to be your follower. We can only do it by your spirit. We only want to do it for your glory. You're an awesome God. We praise you and love you. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.